All right, so I think the title is The Calm Before the Storm. So what did I mean by that? So I think that the, the peak in the market happened in February in the U.S. stock market. At that point, we had a sudden spike up in volatility. We had a big drop in the market in a very, very short period of time. Days the Dow was down 1,000 points. The U.S. dollar in January, which was, I think, part of what prompted the sell-off, the U.S. dollar had its worst January in 30 years. Now, last year uh, was the first down year the dollar had in, in five years. Of course, when the year began, everybody was bullish on the dollar. It was the single most crowded trade. Uh, there was complete consensus of opinion among mainstream thinkers that the dollar had only one way to go, and that was up. The Fed was going to keep raising rates. The economy was going to be strong. It was kind of a no-brainer. And it was a no-brainer because the people who thought that were wrong. Uh, the dollar was, had its biggest decline in 14 years last year. But also, there was a lot of optimism for U.S. economic growth. In fact, when the year began, the Federal Reserve, uh, they have a, a, a forecast. They do this GDP now, the Atlanta Fed. And they had predicted 5.4% GDP growth in the first quarter. Everybody was excited about that. And we ended up getting, I think, 22 um, for the first quarter. And there's still some optimism that the second quarter is going to be over 4%, but I, I seriously doubt that's going to happen. But the U.S. Uh, growth slowed substantially in the first quarter. That probably scared the stock market. But also, one of the things that happened, we passed the tax cut in the U.S., and at the same time, or almost at the same time, we passed a spending bill to dramatically increase government spending. So at the same time, we reduced our revenues coming into the government. We increased the obligations of the government to pay for uh, warfare spending, welfare spending, entitlements, of, of course, uh, on autopilot. So we're now running approximately $100 billion a month deficits in the United States. That's $1.2 trillion a year and rising, right? Because as interest rates are going up, the cost of financing the debt keeps going up, in addition to the fact that the debt is going up because we're borrowing more money. But this is basically more borrowing than we did under Obama during the height of the Great Recession, 2009, 2010, that time frame. And the economy, in theory anyway, isn't even in recession yet we're borrowing all this money. Uh, the U.S. government, I think, in this next fiscal year is going to spend $5 trillion uh, for the first time in history to be a $5 trillion in government spending. So government spending is off the charts. Borrowing is off the charts. Not only uh, are the budget deficits exploding, but the trade deficits are record highs as well. If you, you know, you got to take out oil. So if you take out oil, the U.S. trade deficit is at a record high. But oil prices are rising. In fact, oil prices almost hit $72 a barrel today. That was another multi-year high. And oil prices went up even though the U.S. dollar went up. In fact, the dollar has been having a bear market rally uh, this past uh, month or so. But during that rally, the price of oil has continued to rise anyway. In fact, I read recently that gasoline prices now in Canada at the pump are at all-time record highs. And that's because the Canadian dollar has lost a lot of value since oil was over $100 a barrel. And so now it's actually more expensive. Priced in Canadian dollars, which, by the way, I guess everybody here, you can write a thank you letter to the Bank of Canada because they said that the reason they wanted to keep interest rates so low was because consumer prices weren't high enough. Well, they've now succeeded in causing the price of gasoline to be at a record high, so you can thank them for that because that was their specific goal behind their, their monetary policy. So and if oil prices are this strong with a stronger dollar, imagine what's going to happen to the price of oil when the U.S. dollar starts to decline. But 
we saw we and we had these rising oil prices also earlier in the year rising interest rates the fed is rise, raising interest rates record trade deficits budget you know but record budget deficits all of this began to weigh on the bond market and so the bond market started to break down earlier in the year and it was that breakdown of the bond market that was really the spark that ignited the big decline in the U.S. stock market. Well, once we hit up about 3%, the bond market paused. Bonds, interest rates stopped rising, bond prices stopped falling, and I think the markets kind of breathed a sigh of relief, right? The, the, the Dow rallied back a bit, it didn't make a new high, but it rallied off the lows. The Dow got down to around 23,300, 23,400. We're about 1,000 higher now. We're about 24,500 or so. But the market bounced. And I think people began to think, OK, well, that's not so bad. 3% interest, if that's as high as it goes on the 10-year, we can handle that. That's still low. It's OK. And everybody kind of breathed a sigh of relief. and. Now, just today, the yield on the 10-year spiked up to a new high. We almost got to 3.1. We closed at 3.08. But if you look at a chart, we have now broken out. We had a big move up in interest rates. We went sideways for a while. And now we've broken out in a continuation move. Rates are about to head much higher very quickly. And the stock market in the U.S. should resume its decline as a result of this backup in rates. And the, the people who are minimizing the impact of what's happening with rates are missing two, po two key points. One is that interest rates are going to rise much higher than anybody thinks, right? Because if the Fed is going to continue with its tightening policy, and if the Fed is going to shrink its balance sheet and sell treasuries or allow treasuries to mature, forcing the treasury to not only sell debt to finance the deficits, but to sell additional debt to repay the Fed. If that is going to happen, interest rates are going much, much higher. They're not going to stop at 3%. They're not going to stop at 4 They're not going to stop at 5 They're not going to stop at 6 They are going to keep rising. When you have record amounts of debt, and you have all the inflation that has been building up over the years that is going to be rearing its ugly head. So you're going to have rising inflation premiums. You're going to have more debt on the market. So rates are going to have to go much higher. I mean, rates are still, you know, historically low where they are right now. Why should they stay there? Why should the yield on the 10 year be 3.1 when we have $21 trillion national debt, when we have $1.2 trillion a year? in deficits in the United States, when we have no savings, right? So we should have high interest rates. The reason that we had such low interest rates for a while was because of quantitative easing, was because the Fed had interest rates stuck at zero. That, that's not the case anymore. So rates are going much higher than people think, A, and B, those higher rates are going to have a much more uh, depressing impact on the economy than anybody understands. Because when you build up a debt-based economy, and then the cost of carrying that debt goes up, the economy comes collapsing down. It's only sustainable if interest rates are at rock bottom levels. But when you go from you know, zero, or practically zero, to two and a half, three percent rates, that is a huge problem. It's like if, you know, if, you, if you're addicted to drugs, and now you know, you're, you're still getting drugs, but you're not getting as many as you used to, you know, your body requires a certain amount of that drug. You, we need a certain amount of cheap money. And if we get money that's not as cheap as what we're used to, there's going to be, you know, an economic, uh, you know, a hangover that's going to be a result of that. I think that you're going to see the housing market in the U.S. come down, uh, the auto market, uh, anything that's a function of credit, automobiles, commercial real estate, all this stuff is going to come under pressure. And of course, the stock market, the financial markets, they're all a function of interest rates. You have record high stock market valuations. They're only been supported by record low bond yields. Well, you take away those record low bond yields and you no longer have that prop for the stock market. Meanwhile, I think a lot of the 
the, the so-called economic growth has been a function of hope. It's been a function of uh, the wealth effect of the stock market going up. People have been optimistic that Donald Trump is somehow going to make America great again, that he's going to uh, you know, usher in a new era of prosperity. And so based on a lot of that false optimism, there's been a lot of extra debt that's been taken on, a lot of extra spending. And I think all that is starting to wear off. And so what's going to be happening is as interest rates are rising, it's going to be slowing down the economy, and it's also going to be pushing the stock market into a bear market, not just the stock market. Of course, the bond market is in a bear market. And what does that mean? Well, that means the Fed is not going to do what everybody thinks it's going to do. Because if rising interest rates push the economy into recession and push the stock market into a bear market, what is the Fed going to do? They're not going to sit back and just watch that re recession run its course. They're not just going to sit back and allow that bear market to play out. I mean, who knows how big it's going to be? Will the Dow go down 50 percent, 60 percent, 70 percent? You know, there's an election coming up in November. Powell wants to help Donald Trump keep the Republicans in Congress. Right. What have the Democrats promised to do if they get Procon? They want to impeach him. So there's going to be a lot of political pressure on this newly appointed Republican Fed chairman to try to make sure that voters are going into the voting booths uh, happier. Right? And if, they're, if the market is crashing, if the economy is in recession, if they've lost their job, even their crappy job, they're not going to be likely to vote for the incumbent party. So I think the markets are going to be very surprised uh, by what happens. Because again, everybody is prepared for the Fed to keep hiking. Everybody is prepared for the Fed to shrink its balance sheet. But what's actually going to happen is the reverse. The Fed is going to start cutting rates again. They're never going to succeed in normalization. And they're not going to shrink their balance sheet. They're going to have to launch another round of quantitative easing. Because if they don't do that, rates will rise to the point where everything is going to collapse. So even though they've been talking about this, in reality, it is impossible to actually pull it off. Now, what I think is going to happen, though, is when the markets are surprised by this reaction, it is not going to be the favorable reaction that the Federal Reserve got the first two times it bailed everybody out. You know, the first time was when the stock market bubble, the Nasdaq bubble, popped in 2000. They were able to cut interest rates down to 1%, and they were able to reflate another bubble bail out investors, kick the can down the road. Then we had the 2008 financial crisis, right? Then what did they do? Well, the next time they slashed interest rates down to zero. One wasn't low enough. They had to go to zero. And they did three rounds of quantitative easing, and they blew up a $4.5 trillion balance sheet. Now, the third time they have to do it, well, if zero was, you know, they can't go below zero unless they try to go negative, right? Maybe they will. Maybe they'll try to take the Fed funds negative. They're going to have to do another round of quantitative easing, but it's going to have to be bigger. See, the first time they didn't even need quantitative easing. They didn't even have to do that in 2001. But then they blew up the housing bubble. That was bigger than the stock market bubble. So now they needed the quantitative easing to kind of reflate that busted bubble. But what they have created now is so much bigger. The distortions in the U.S. economy are so much greater. The damage that has been done is so much greater. To attempt to try to reflate a bigger bubble than the one that popped so that we can kind of pretend that we have a recovery would require such a large amount of that stimulus, that quantity. I think that we end up killing the economy with an overdose. And I think what happens is instead of the Fed buying bonds, propping up the bond market, the bond market tanks. See, right now you're actually starting to see some of this pressure in some of the emerging markets because traders are seeing now emerging market currencies dropping again as inflation rates are rising and central banks are reluctant to raise rates to try to fight the inflation, even though because their rates are already high. But that's the exact same predicament that the Fed is going to be in because this time when the Fed would try to cut rates or do QE to prop up the markets and the economy, inflation, which is already above 2%, which is the Fed's supposed you know, line, is going to get higher. And as official inflation rates are at 3% or 4%, how is the Fed then, in the face of rising inflation, 
going to be able to slash interest rates and print money. They're not going to be able to. I mean, they're going to do it, but the reaction is going to be swift in the currency markets and the bond market because I think the bond market is going to continue to fall even though the Fed is buying bonds trying to suppress interest rates because there's going to be no other buyers. You're not going to have this Chinese buying. You're not going to have the Japanese buying, the Saudis buying, the Russians buying. Meanwhile, there's a lot of bonds out there that are going to be sold. And it's not just going to be treasury bonds that the world's going to sell. It's going to be corporate bonds. It's going to be anything with a low coupon because if the market sense that inflation is going out of control and there's nothing the Federal Reserve can do about it, they're not going to want to go down with that ship. They're going to want to get rid of these bonds because the only way the Fed would be able to put out that inflationary fire would be to get aggressive with monetary policy, to actually shrink the balance sheet and jack up interest rates. But how are they going to do that in a recession? I mean, politically, there's no way they're going to do it because it would make the recession much worse. Now, of course, that's better than the alternative, right? The alternative is they destroy the dollar. But that's what they're going to end up doing because that's going to be the politically expedient route for the central bankers to take because they never want to do what's right. They always want to do what's easy, right? And it's much easier to print money than admit that you're broke. Right? It's much easier to try to screw all your creditors with inflation than to honestly admit that you're not going to pay. And I think the, the catalyst for this is here. I mean, we're starting to see the weakness, as I said today, the breakdown in the bond market. I would expect to see follow through uh, from today's move in bonds tomorrow, this week, next week. The Dow was only down about 200 points today. That's just the beginning of this next move down. The only thing that might temporarily stop bond prices from collapsing would be a thousand point drop in the Dow. Because what happens is when the Dow really starts to fall, you get a bid in the bond market, right? Because now people think, oh, people, you know, maybe the Fed is going to have to cut back on the rate hikes, right? There's a little bit of a, you know, uh, of a move to the, the bond market. But then as soon as the bond market rallies, because the stock market's going down, then the stock market starts to go up, then the bond market sees that and well, it resumes its decline, right? It's kind of like, you know, you don't know what, what's actually the dog and what's the tail, but I think it's all the bond market. And as the bond market breaks down, right now the dollar has rallied a little bit, but that's because traders don't get that rising interest rates and weak bonds are not good for the dollar. They're bad for the dollar because it slows the U.S. economy and it widens the deficits. It makes the budget deficits bigger and harder to finance. And also, of course, rising interest rates feed into rising inflation. The price of money is an important component in the cost structure of most businesses. And as interest rates are going up, prices are going up. Interest rates are prices. They're the price of money, but it's an, it's an important price. And so as you have rising interest rates, you have rising inflation. Rising inflation is not good for a currency. You have, you know, people think that rising inflation is good for the dollar. Rising inflation is the definition of a weak dollar. It means the dollar is losing purchasing power. That's what inflation is. So rising inflation is not bearish for the dollar. I mean, bullish for the dollar. And it's not bearish for gold. Gold was down 20 bucks today because of the strong dollar and because of the, the increase in interest rates. But rising inflation is good for gold. It's not bad for gold. People buy gold as a hedge against inflation. So if inflation is picking up, then the price of gold is going to pick up as well. And since uh, f falling bond prices are bad for the dollar, right, gold's going to rise. And remember that all bonds are are dollars with a coupon. They're dollars that you're going to be paid in the future. So if bonds are losing value, then the dollar is losing value. I mean, why else would you buy bonds unless you want to buy dollars? So the markets in the short run have this wrong. But in the long run, and the long run is not that far off, all of this is going to be very bad for the dollar. And of course, one of the biggest problems for the United States is the politics of all this are lousy, right? Because Donald Trump, you know, campaigned. He was going to shrink government. He was going to cut regulation. He was going to do all sorts of things to make America great again. And based on that, he got a lot of people to vote for him. But none of that has been delivered. I mean, Trump has basically done the opposite of a lot of what he campaigned on. The only promise he kept is he cut taxes. But since government spending increased dramatically, the tax cuts mean nothing, right? Ta government, uh, the, the cost of government is what it spends. 
not what it taxes. So if you want to cut taxes, you have to cut spending. That's the only way to make government less expensive is to reduce the amount of spending. If you increase the amount of spending, then government is more expensive and the taxpayers are on the hook for it, one way or another. And I think that the crisis that is coming is going to be a dollar crisis and it's going to be a sovereign debt crisis. That's the only way that this thing is going to end. And if it happens in the next several years, which is very possible given where we are, Trump's not going to get reelected. And what is the next direction that the American public is going to vote for? It's going to be hard left, right? It's going to be socialist because Bernie Sanders already kind of made socialism mainstream by running as a socialist and almost getting the Democratic nomination. He probably, he probably would have had it if it wasn't for the Clinton's control of the convention and the delegate process. And had Sanders uh, got the nomination, he might have beat Trump. You know, I, th I thought he had a better chance of winning than did Hillary. But if the economy falls apart, and the people who voted for Trump are let down because they're in worse shape in 2020 than they were in 2016 when they voted for change, and you know the swamp is deeper than ever, we can easily see uh, a socialist president in the United States, even if it's the Democratic Party, it's the Socialist Party, and we can see socialists controlling both houses of Congress, and that's going to be throwing gasoline on the fire. So, you know, what do we do? Be, you know, now, how do we prepare for that? Again, I've been, I've been you know, advocating this strategy for many, many years because I've seen the end game from the beginning. It's just that you never know exactly how long things are going to take to play out or what's going to happen. It's, you know, it's always difficult to know exactly when things are going to happen. But in the long-term scheme of things, whether we had a dollar collapse in 2010 or 2015 or 2020, as far as history is concerned, it's the same chapter. I mean, the time frame is still relatively short. Trying to get it to the exact day or the exact year, nobody could do that, right? But, you know, whenever something happens, like the bursting of the dot-com or the 2008 financial crisis, the same people always say, oh, nobody could have possibly seen this coming. Oh, this is, this is completely unpredictable. This is completely out of left field, right? They have no idea. None of that is true it's very easy to see it coming, right? It's just that when you see it coming, you see it coming from a, a mile away, right? Because the signs are actually obvious for the people who know what to look for. There's no way that people who understand this are not gonna see it until the day before it happens. Because once you get the economics, when you understand the true damage that monetary policy can do to an economy, Right? You understand that. Well, you see the damage early on, even if it takes years and years to manifest itself in a way that other people recognize it. Because initially, look, people don't think a stock market bubble is a problem. They think it's prosperity. Hey, if you own stocks and they're going up, why, why, why are you going to complain that there's a bubble? Right. So everything feels good until, you know, until the party's over. And nobody wants to question it. Nobody wants to rain on the parade. Certainly not the politicians. You know, they want to, they, they want to, they want pe happy people voting for them. The bankers, the, the, the brokerage firms, everybody makes money off bubbles, right? So nobody has any kind of vested interest. And anybody who points it out, oh, you're stop clock, you're a perma bear. And then when it happens, oh, you know, they just, you know, they discredit it. But you know, understanding this is not complicated, but it does take patience to make money. You do have to ride out, uh, you know, the, the, the waves in the market. You've got to understand, you know, what the noise is. Now, for people t today, if you don't have your portfolios proper in the proper place, you actually, you know, you, you, know, you, you, you actually have uh, an opportunity here because I don't think there's that many years left. I mean, there are people that have followed my advice that have been prepared for this for five years, 10 years, you know, Preparing now with the benefit of hindsight is actually better because the last, you know, since 2009, you know, you've done very well in the U.S. stock market because of the Fed. 
Now, most of those gains are going to evaporate if people stay at the party too long, and most people will because that's what they always do. But you still have plenty of time to build the right kind of portfolio that's going to prevail and the end game. And what's that going to be? That's going to be a portfolio that's going to have a lot of exposure to resources, to gold, to silver. The oil, the bull market in oil is just getting started again. I mean, we're now back over 70. We should be at 80 to 100 before the end of the year. We're going to take out the high of 140, 150 that we had in 2008. No doubt in my mind that high is going to get taken out. The dollar is going to be a lot lower when that happens. We're going to take out that high from 1900 in, uh, in gold in 2011. Remember, gold went from under 300 to over 1900. That was a big run. We had a pause for a few years, and the next move up is going to be even bigger than the one from 300 to 1900. Think of all the money that's been printed since 2011. All the monetary mistakes, all the negative interest rates all around the world. Right? That's going to drive the next bull move in gold. You got to get into these emerging markets. A lot of these economies that have suffered based on an overvalued dollar, they're going to experience massive relief when the dollar comes down. Their dollar debt is going to be forgiven. Prices are going to come down for dollar denominated commodities, right? Their purchasing power is going to go up. So you have to understand how purchasing power is going to ultimately be reallocated. You got to own, be, invest in countries that will benefit uh, from this shift in consumption and purchasing power, that will benefit from a boom in the resource sector, right? There are a lot of markets or a lot of companies that are going to do very well. This is not, you know, uh, there's going to be winners and losers. It's not like everybody has to lose. But you have to be positioned the right way. You can either ride the wave or you can be crushed by the wave. Most people are going to be crushed by it because they have no idea that it's even coming, right? Uh, because, you know, and it's the same people who were oblivious to the problems in the past because they, they think the Federal Reserve solved the problems. But if they understood the problem in the first place, they would recognize that all they did is make the problem that they created worse because their solution was more of what caused the problem, right? And you can't drink yourself sober, right? No matter how much alcohol you drink, it's not going to work. Maybe you'll feel good for a while, but eventually you're going to pass out. And that's what's going to happen to the U.S. economy. So I passed out all these cards. And the purpose of these cards is to, A, I can get you on my newsletter if you're not on my newsletter. How many people listen to my podcasts? Yeah, all right. I recorded one this afternoon in my hotel room, so you can listen to it tonight. Some of the stuff I just said is in there. But it's not exactly the same because I don't have a script. But I put you up on my newsletter, and I, and I let you know where I'm going to be. I'm in Las Vegas tomorrow. I'm speaking at the Money Show. I was actually there yesterday, too. And on, uh, on uh, Saturday, I'm speaking at, a, at an event in, in Puerto Rico, which is, by the way, where I live now, although I'm spending the summer in Connecticut. But I let you know, if you live in an area where I'm going to be, I send you an email, hey, I'm going to be at such and such if you want to come down. But I think the most important thing is so that I can get in touch with everybody about setting up an account so that I can manage your money. In fact, my company, Europe Pacific Asset Management, which is now based in Puerto Rico, is in the process of licensing uh, here in, uh, in Canada as well uh, so that we can manage money for Canadians directly from my asset management company in Puerto Rico. So if you fill out these cards, I'll make sure that when we get that program up and running uh, that we're in touch with you uh, about setting up a managed account. Also, people Canadians will be able to buy my mutual funds. Up until now, uh, I've heard Canadians are not able to buy my mutual funds, but once I, I get registered, I will be able to buy for Canadian citizens any of my five mutual funds that American citizens can buy now. In fact, my gold fund um, is now rated the number one gold fund. I think it's the only gold fund, at least it was, maybe not as of today, that was positive on the year. But it is the number one fund out of seven funds. Morningstar gives it a five stars. But since the date I formed it about three years ago, it is the number one gold fund uh, out of all the gold funds that exist. So it's done well, but I have an emerging market fund. I've got a value fund. I've got a dividend payers fund. And I've got a bond fund. So up until, you know, including today, Canadians aren't allowed to buy them. But once I complete this process, then Canadians that open up an account with me will be able to buy those funds. I think the only thing is you might have to be an accredited investor. I forget the definition for, for accredited, but it's, I think it's a lower bar in, uh, in Canada. 
But if you fill out those cards, pass them to me, uh, you know, I guess, I guess the exhibit hall is closing, so I'll just grab them at the end. And then I'll make sure and be in contact with you um, uh, af after, you know, once we, get, once we get fully set up. Anyway, I think I'm out of time. My light is flashing. Thanks, everybody.